Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, special scrutiny meeting. I would like to welcome the um, representation from the Alza Silly Steamship Company. Um, first, uh, I would like to say, I'm sorry, um, I don't feel up to taking this meeting. Sorry. I'd like to, uh, and my uh, vice chairman um, feels he uh, can't take the meeting either. So I would like to propose that Councillor Marcus uh, take over the chairmanship of this meeting. Could I have a vote, a uh, seconder on that? Thank you. And all those in favour? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, what we'll do is start the agenda with declarations of interest, please. Is there anyone got any declarations of interest? No. Uh, okay. Oh, I was going to say, um, yeah, I, I, reason I can't chair the meeting in Apple status because I'm the member for transport, and I think it would be somewhat problematic. Um, so that's my declaration of interest. It doesn't mean I have to attend the meeting, but I certainly cannot resist to chair it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I have a pecuniary interest uh, as I'm a shareholder of the um, Alza Silly Steamship Company, and also uh, uh, my step um, grandchild is working for Harland and Wolf. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on, number two urgent items. There are none. So we'll move into part one. Um, bars of City Ceilings presented by Nigel. Nigel, do you want to introduce the paper, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and thanks for the opportunity to present this paper to you today. Um, the paper sets out the background and the need for uh, the meeting of this scrutiny committee um, today. As members will be aware, um, we now have two um, operators proposing to provide uh, passenger and freight services uh, by SeaLink um during 2024 and both have uh, made their proposals uh, known um over the past uh, months and indeed have also put forward uh, proposals for future years clearly that's been done in different places and in different ways and um it's important that from uh, an island's perspective that the council uh, play a role in actually bringing those proposals together into one place and so that we have a holistic view of all the services that will be provided uh, for the islands not just in 2024 but what both operators are planning for subsequent years so the meeting today is part of that process of bringing together all that information in one place we are not here today as a committee to form a judgment on one operator's plans versus the other, or that one operator merits of their proposals versus another, but to actually bring together all this information to provide a, a holistic view of all the services that will be provided, and then take that view and measure it against the needs of everybody who relies on uh, these ceiling services on the islands, be that the community, businesses, or visitors to the islands. And I think that's this marks the beginning of a change from the council as a promoter of the Sea Links project with the backing of levelling up funding and now moving to one where 
has the responsibility to actually look at the services that will be provided uh, by uh, the private sector, by the operators, and how closely that meets uh, the needs of, as I say, everyone who relies on these transport services in the future. And if indeed there are still shortfalls in the service provision, what are they? Can they be addressed by the operators? Or is there a role for the council in making further representations to the government in how those gaps are, are filled in the future? So as I said, Chair, I think this marks the beginning of a, of a different phase in terms of how the council uh, goes forward and the role that it takes. Clearly, uh, this is just the start of that process. It is proposed that all the information that your committee collects today will be presented to a meeting of full council in April. And it will be at that meeting uh, that members will need to take a decision on the council's future role in respect of transport services that the islands receives in the future. I hope that's uh, helpful by way of introduction. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, would it be, um, I've got a brief note that you prepared earlier and just to go through for the benefit of the public um, how the meeting's going to run. Um, would you like to do that, if that's OK? Or uh, Thank you, Chair. Happy, happy to do that. Um, for the benefit of members and, and the public who um, are in attendance or watching the meeting at present, uh, the meeting is, is essentially split into two main parts. Uh, the first part is to receive a presentation from um, the uh, Sea Link, uh, the Alza City Steamship Company, on uh, their plans for 2024 and future years, uh, followed by which there will be an opportunity for members to ask questions relating to the presentation that they will receive today. And then the second part of the meeting is for representatives from Harland and Wolf to appear before the committee, um, also give a presentation and take questions from uh, members uh, on that presentation. Um, in order to make sure that uh, the council is uh, treating both operators in exactly the same way, it was deemed appropriate that uh, your committee goes into part three to receive these presentations and to uh, for members to ask questions. Um, I recognise that means excluding the public, but that was seen as being practically the best way of making sure that the operator that comes on second this morning doesn't get the opportunity to view what the um, other operator is uh, is saying in their presentation and perhaps um, adjust uh, their responses accordingly. Uh, we have to recognise the fact that both operators are in competition um, and uh, therefore we have to be entirely even handed in terms of how we as the council uh, deal with the representations from both operators. So I hope that's uh, helpful. Uh, the meeting is being recorded this morning um, and it is proposed that a full recording uh, be made available on the council's website shortly after the meeting. Um, so as there's a tremendous amount of interest in hearing directly from both operators, their proposals for 2024 and subsequent years. I hope that's helpful, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, yeah, and for me personally, I would like to concentrate on the future rather than um, what's gone on in the past. So uh, I've, um, members can obviously ask any questions they want, but uh, we need to decide and help. We need to, sorry, we need to weigh up and um, get some understanding on how the operators will provide services for the community, for the biz for business and residents, uh, and for the um, visitor economy as well. Um, with that, unless there are any questions, I think uh, it's probably wise to move on to the first recommendation, um, which, unless any members got any questions? No? So the first recommendation is that following introduction, members approve that the meeting moves into part three to receive presentations from the two ceiling operators and their responses to questions from members for the reasons set out in paragraph eight of this report and that a full recording of the meeting be made publicly available on the council's website shortly after the meeting has finished. And I have a proposal for that recommendation. Councillor Peacock, the seconder, please. Yeah. Councillor Sims, all those in favour. So that is unanimous. 
So we are now moving into part three, uh, which means I have to exclude the public. Thank you very much. Uh, part three reports contain exempt information. Uh, the exclusion of public is voted on about councillors has been approved that under section 100A4 of the Local Government Act of 1972, the public be excluded from the meeting for the following item of business on the grounds that involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph three of part one of schedule 12A of that act as amended, being information about the business affairs of particular persons. I think, is that fine to go on? Yeah. Brilliant. So with that, I'd like to hand over to our representatives from the steamship company, please. Um, away you go. Ian, sorry, can you use the microphone on just so that you point I'd that like, towards I'd you like as well. I'd like to stand if uh, the microphone works satisfactorily for those online. Can you hear me online? Yes, fine, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Um, First of all, our condolences to the chair for her for, for her loss, and we think you're very brave for, for coming along this morning. Um, by way of introductions, I, I think you do all know our our team here. Uh, but starting on my right, Judith, CFO, Stuart, CEO. I'm the chair, and Sam is our senior independent director and one of our now three representatives on the uh, on the islands. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's the first day of spring. Uh, a season of, of new beginnings, new beginnings, and I, I genuinely hope that this meeting will start um, a new chapter in our relationship with the with the council. We we really value this opportunity. Um, and and I, I think this new chapter will see us working together much more closely in the future as our bef as befits our relative positions in the uh, in the community. Due to the limited time allocation, um, I'd like to advise we've submitted a slide set which I can see that you you all have, and you may find that useful to review that outside of the meeting as well. Um, not only is there some additional detail there, but there are some topics covered which um, time does not permit me to address today. Um, we take the point, Chair, about looking to the future, but I will be talking a little bit about the past. And it's important to highlight that we have been serving Silly for over 100 years and we intend to carry on doing that into the future. We do nothing else. We are a local company employing 200 local people of whom 35 are resident islanders. And whilst it may not always look like it, we try to do our very best for the silly community. We also still have well over 200 Islander shareholders owning over one third of the total share capital of the company. Uh, and at our last annual general meeting in October, those islanders present, around 50, including those online, supported us 100 percent in what in what we were doing and how we were going about it. And what we're doing, of course, is building new vessels. We're building them in Vietnam because we get greater value for money and we're borrowing a lot of money to pay for them. Of course, we ultimately decided to no longer pursue levelling up funding. And whilst this subject is complex, I have been disappointed to read and hear so many inaccurate comments relating to our decision. I'm now going to try and capture as best I can why we did what we did, because even now, despite our best attempts, there's still a, quite a lot of confusion around the subject. Losing 
losing the route. Let's get this one off the table uh, straight away. Um, we were concerned about losing the right to operate the route in the future, perhaps five or six years after the ship came into service, when there would be a requirement to retender. A number of you have said to me that this should not have been a legitimate concern. But given the lack of control for us that was inherent in the most recent special purpose vehicle proposal, more about which later, and the catastrophic impact that losing the route would have on our employees and shareholders if we were to lose the right to operate it. It was something that we as a board felt we had to take really seriously. The second thing was delay. And that was perhaps of much more consequence to the board. Um, the delay inherent in protracted further discussions with government and, and with Council for the Isles of Scilly. Just to remind you that the original award was indeed in the form of grant funding. Uh, and the funding would have come directly to the steamship group, as was announced by Boris Johnson in 2021. It, however, then took 10 months for government to conclude that funding as directly would not work. And having reached that decision, a further 12 months before they came up with the special purpose vehicle concept, which proved to be fraught with problems. Moreover, despite the best endeavours of the Department for Transport, because of the threat of legal challenge, we may have had to go back to square one on the design of the vessels and on the procurement process. And I actually received a direct verbal threat, charming, charmingly put, but nevertheless a direct verbal threat from the National Shipbuilding Office that they would use all powers at their disposal to stop us building abroad if we were to take the government's money. A further threat came from UK based shipbuilders themselves who felt that there would be legitimate grounds for a challenge if we did not choose them. Why did we not choose a UK shipyard? Our evaluation process started with over 30 shipyards from all around the world, including two in the UK, which both made our short list of five. Much as we would have liked to build in the UK, the one UK shipyard that produced a fully compliant offer was not able to provide a refund guarantee, was significantly more expensive and lacked the technical expertise and the recent shipbuilding experience that you would uh, require. It would have been far too much of a risk to go with them. A boat too far, you might say. Reverting to the risk of challenge under levelling up funding, all these obstacles could quite easily have added years onto the build process and tens of millions of pounds to the overall cost of building vessels. Actually, though, resilience was at least as important. Every year that passes, our vessels do get older and more prone to failure, and we were not prepared to wish that vulnerability on our customer base. We had to get on with the purchase of new ships. One final remark on this critical issue of delay. We're not so different that we can't draw conclusions from what is happening elsewhere around the country. Only 20% of levelling up projects approved by government to date have actually started. There is just so much red tape, so much bureaucracy that projects are failing before they even start. I don't know if any of you saw the article in the Times on Friday or Saturday of last week, but actually the number quoted there was that only 10% of levelling up funding 
uh, has been spent by councils to date. We've worked hard over the last few years to put ourselves into a financial position to do it ourselves. That's the decision we've taken to do it ourselves, keep control and bring new vessels. So important to bring new vessels into service much, much quicker. On the subject of money, um, one of the common misconceptions around the levelling up proposal was that the levelling up funding be passed through Council for the Isles of Scilly to the special purpose vehicle, that that money was free money. In other words, that it was a, a grant. Nothing could be further from the case from an operator's perspective. When the business case was originally submitted in June 21, it was indeed on the basis of a 90% government grant and a 10% contribution from ourselves. However, this changed, as I indicated earlier, with the now infamous letter from Minister Courts in August 2022. When the realisation dawned that this would not be free money, and we said as much to the Department of Transport, the, re the response was, did you really expect free money? To which we said, well, actually, yes, we, we did. The approximate annual lease charge to the steamship group from the special purpose vehicle was 1.5 million to 2 million pounds. Yes, cheaper than the repayments on our loan, but certainly not free money. Reduced cost, yes, but also reduced revenue because the deal was that the passenger fares we would then have to charge would revert back to 2022 levels. So our modelling, when we put all the numbers through the computer, or when Judith did, a specialism if you like, um, our modelling indicated that whilst we could still envisage making a profit under the SPV model, it would not be as big a profit and not enough, this is the critical point, it's not about making enormous profits, not enough to subsidise Skybus, which we have done since Skybus was set up a number of years ago now. Um, and that Skybus subsidy is something that we'll come back to again uh, later. Um, so that's actually our third big reason for not going ahead with levelling up. The first one was potentially losing the licence. The second one was the inherent delay. And the third one was the lack of recognition um, of the interdependency of Skybus, which we all rely on, providing a lifeline link on our marine operations. I confidently expect that there will be questions on this later, but I'm going to move to a subject which a number of members have raised of late, namely the subject of reliability and resilience. Um, we all recognise that our vessels are getting older, but you might be surprised to learn that over the last 12 months, the Salonian has not once failed to sail due to technical issues. We've had 0% technical issues. The technical failure rate on the GRI is also very good at 3.7%. Our crews and support teams really do their utmost to ensure that our vessels are always fit to, to sail. But bad weather, and we were just talking about that before we started, bad weather has had a really adverse impact. Skybus, for example, has had a 118% increase in flight cancellations due to bad weather over the last 12 months. And that is partly the reason why Skybus passenger numbers were lower this year. Um, it may also be due, I have to recognize that, to the cost of living which has seen more people book uh, with the Salonian rather than fly. So when, when the keyboard warriors start blaming the company for a cancellation, it is almost certainly due to weather conditions. And that is clearly not within our direct control. We will never operate Skybus or our vessels in dangerous conditions. The safety of our passengers and our crew is always our top priority 
in fact, health and safety is always the first item on our board agenda when we meet. Weather patterns are changing, and it seems that the incidence of storm conditions is increasing. Just as well, then, that when we looked at the results of our community engagement survey, which we carried out at the start of the vessel replacement project, we took on board the strong message from the community that resilience was an absolute priority above, say, journey time or anything else. And so we designed Salonian 4, like its predecessor, to be a robust vessel capable of sailing in significant swells. Uh, and you might compare this to the significantly lower threshold of um, a fast cat, uh, or more specifically of the Atlantic Wolf, although we understand that we might not be seeing the Atlantic Wolf. It is galling. It is galling when a rival operator comes along with a, a summer season fast cat with a view to creaming off the, um, the seasonal business. I'm sure you will have thought of this, that there will be a lot of disruption to visitors if, as we expect, uh, a competitor's vessel is frequently unable to sail due to excessive wave height. As you know, the profits we make over the summer offset the losses we sustain over the rest of the year. The profits allow us to provide an all round year, an all round, an all year round air service. If another company does a summer profit grab, it will potentially impact our ability to offer Islanders services outside of the main season. Our fares are priced in order to ensure the company is profitable and our services are sustainable. It is worth noting that the level of our day trip fares, which have not increased for over five years, has ensured that around 30,000 day trippers board the Salonian and visit the islands every year. These day trip fares are much lower than what the competition is uh, apparently intending to charge, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it seems to be targeting day trippers due to its um, that their ship's inability to take luggage in the hold. The cost of running a safe and compliant airline and airport is enormous. Aviation regulation drives 90% of our cost base a significant proportion of which is fixed and cannot be reduced to offset a fall in passenger numbers when that occurs. Despite minimising any increase, you can see from our accounts that Skybus barely breaks even every year, and this year it's going to make a loss. The high price of fuel and rising inflation over recent years has made it even more difficult to keep prices down. The price of airfares is not helped by the fact that 20% of a standard fare from Land's End is the St Mary's landing charge. And we'd like to come back to that as well. I'd like to address a number of issues about the current and prospective service, both passenger and freight, starting with the current passenger vessel and its schedule. Of course, you all know that the model is that the tourist business subsidises the locals um, to the tune of almost 70%. So, so broadly speaking, the Salonian absolutely has to start the day in Penzance for those tourists. We're acutely conscious that this is unhelpful for those wanting to get off the islands. Uh, and so what we're planning to do in the future is to increase the incidence of double sailings so that visitors can get onto the islands earlier, 
but most importantly, islanders can be in Penzance by lunchtime. Salonian 4 will also be a little faster than Salonian 3, and that should give us a little bit more flexibility as well in due course. Um, some of you may not yet be aware that we've also now introduced online check-in uh, processes to improve boarding speed. So we anticipate, and I think we're already seeing this in, in reality, we anticipate that embarkation and disembarkation will uh, therefore also be much quicker from, from now on. Of course, islanders do avail themselves of a berth on the thrice weekly GRI service and with the new freight vessel, that passenger option for local people will be more formalised and more integrated into our schedule and it will be a genuine passenger service with a, uh, a lounge and comfortable seats and all, all that sort of thing. It'll be a genuine all year round service for local people. As we've communicated already, passenger fares will continue to rise by 5% plus inflation over the next few years for visitors. Island affairs will be limited, uh, island affair increases will be limited to inflation only. We cannot get around those increases for visitors, but we hope that sailing on a modern, more environmentally friendly, more stable ship should ensure that visitors continue to select the steamship group and continue to want to travel to these beautiful islands. Freight transport is a complex issue due to the infrastructure constraints that we have. A particular issue right now um, becoming really acute is that of the bottlenecks on Penzance Quay and the related issues of aggregation. I'm pleased to be able to report that we have signed heads of agreement for a new out of town depot, which will enable us to provide storage for our customers and to process delivery vehicles promptly and efficiently. As far as cargo capacity on the Gry and the Salonian is concerned, we're recognising that we cannot entirely meet customer demand right now, particularly for building materials. And so we are actively looking at options for increasing our capacity in that respect. It is very important to us to be able to meet the community's needs on freight freight of all kinds now and in the future. After all, our vision as a company is delivering for Scilly. We only deliver for Scilly. It is not a sideline um, as it is for others. It is our raison d'etre, our reason for being. When I took over as chair five years ago, we developed a set of values and these recognise the paramount importance of serving the community and looking after our customers, the silly community and our employees. We've recently appointed a, one more island based non executive director, Andrew Walder, and we've also relaunched our advisory board. These steps are intended to demonstrate that we really do care about what the islanders need and are keen to listen to their suggestions. This will ensure, we hope, that we really step up our regular information flow to and from the community. The relationship with the Council, the Isles of Scilly, is absolutely critical to us and it genuinely grieves us that we've not succeeded in improving it to date. We, we make an exception, by the way, for the chief executives, old and new. It is more with some members of the council where we've really struggled, particularly when their 
personal, uh, quite often regrettably ill-informed views are aired on social media. We have the utmost respect for the vocational nature of what you as members of the council do and your desire to serve the community. And it is such a shame that these personal opinions have rather tainted um, the, uh, the respect and trust that we, we have for each other. Um, of course, we're also accountable not just to the community like, like you are, but we're also accountable to our shareholders as well. And I just wanted to say in that respect that I, I don't want you to think that the shareholders, which include myself clearly, are milking the company for all it's worth um, at the expense of the community. In the last five years, we've we've paid dividends only once, and all the profits that we've generated have gone to reserves so that we had enough money to put down a 20% deposit on the new ships, which we've which we've now done. We've already warned shareholders to the disappointment of some not to expect much in the way of dividends for the next two or three years whilst the ships are being, are being built. So in many ways, this company is um, not at all dissimilar to a social enterprise or a, or a community interest company. Going back to our relationship, um, I would really welcome uh, a slightly inf more informal meeting with members of the council where we can say, this is where we are. This is, this is where we want to go. What can we do jointly to work towards this? An example might be working together to obtain air subsidies from government to lower the cost of air transport over the winter in particular, or securing a capital or revenue subsidy for the airport to address its uh, asset replacement fund in particular. Um, that would then potentially reduce the cost of the landing fees, allowing all aviation passengers to benefit from lower fares. The, the recent 18% increase imposed by the council is going to make airfares unaffordable for some and we jointly need to recognize that this is a real issue and and try to address it jointly our fares and freight charges are set and will be set at a level sufficient for us to generate enough cash to pay interest on our loan during the leveling up discussions the department for transport looked at our accounts uh, and was entirely satisfied that our level of profitability and our plans were reasonable and appropriate and that we were not actually abusing our market position. I don't think you'd expect anything else, but, but I, I just mentioned that. Harlan and Wolf, um, this would be a, a fascinating story if it wasn't so fraught with, uh, with risk. Um, I really believe the council needs to give serious thought to the implications of what the company is trying to do. Fundamentally, competition is healthy and, and keeps us on our toes, but the, the market here is limited and not necessarily big enough for two. That's certainly what Harlan and Wolf thinks because it has said as much. If Harlan and Wolf takes the cream of the peak season in the short term, be it passengers or freight, then it will be very tough for us to continue with our operations as they are. Skybus in particular will be threatened. Does it really seem fair to you that we should run loss making services in winter uh, when Harlem Wolf is putting a massive dent in our summer revenue? What we're what we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is a, is a, a startup company. It's a gas storage startup company and when it was started up it was called Infrastrata and then it actually bought the Harland and Wolf name together with um, some assets like 
um, shipyards out of receivership. Arlen and Wolf was in receivership and the assets were sold off at a discount. So with its new name, with its new name, it now pretends that it's been around since 1861, but it's actually more like 2017, something like that. And it, it relies on that to that image to um, give the impression that it can build ships and run passenger services and all these other things, which actually has very, very little experience of. I'm sure you know all this yourself, but I don't mention it. It is burdened with debt, as indeed are we. But unlike us, it's uh, significantly loss making and needs to refinance to survive. And a recent profits warning on the stock exchange has spooked investors further, such that its value is only 18 million pounds, about the same size as our balance sheet. Uh, operating a ferry service is a sideline to their core businesses and their intentions are not at all clear. If it is a fast cut service, well, we, we can't make the numbers add up. Uh, we don't understand how it can be commercially viable in the long term. Um, questions also arise on um, environmental issues, both, both the uh, fuel burn, uh, the threat to the Isles of Scilly seagrass uh, in the harbour, and, and uh, there were all kinds of other issues. I'm sure you're aware of them all. Um, I would like to pass over to Stuart uh, in a minute to talk um, in more detail about operations. Um, just to summarise what we what we would really like. What we'd really like is to draw a line under levelling up and move forward positively with the council on all aspects of the sea and air links to Scilly. We would be very happy to collaborate on air subsidies, uh, to discuss scheduling. We'd, we'd like to look strategically at the next generation of vessels so that if they require a change in infrastructure that can start being planned for because these things take decades to achieve. Um, we want a much closer, much more proactive co collaborative relationship with uh, with you together with our local member of parliament whoever that might uh, be we want to work together with the council for the benefit of the community there should be no taboo zones no acrimony just a common desire to work for a better a better future uh, thank you ladies and gentlemen i'd now like to hand over to uh, to stuart Uh, good morning all. For my part of the presentation, I'm going to cover our services for 2024 for the forthcoming season and then our future services and specifically for the new vessel projects for 2024. So for 2024, we will continue to deliver Lifeline Sea Link services the transport of both passengers and freight. The GRI will continue to deliver a three times a week scheduled service all year round. Salonian 3 has already commenced operations and will continue throughout the season. I'm pleased to announce today that we have extended Salonian 3 season at the request of the community until the 10th of November, demonstrating our values vision and service to this community. We have also amended Salonian 3's timetables for operations throughout October 2024 as a result of feedback from our last consultation event on St Mary's. As Ian has already suggested, we will be implementing further additional sailings for Salonian 3 for this season and dynamic timetabling subject to harbour approvals. Again, on our first Salonian sailing of the season, I'm pleased to announce the successful implementation of online check-in, uh, which has certainly accelerated the embarkation of our passengers, meaning speedier journeys. The Salonian continues to perform well in all conditions and with 100% service delivery over the past 12 months. This demonstrates our resilient and robust service we deliver all year round. 
for Skybus, we are still providing capacity of 70,000 passenger movements for the forthcoming season. And again, as already been mentioned, in addition, the GRI has and will continue to accept passengers with over 60 passengers traveling on the GRI during February alone. New for the 2024 season, as part of our continuous service improvements for 2024, we have agreed heads of terms for our new freight depot close to the A30, which will improve delivery access for suppliers. We are also investigating additional freight capacity for the ceiling service. The new depot, the additional ceiling freight capacity, the GRI and island carriers can provide the in-house end-to-end freight logistics solution the islands needs. And finally, for 2024, our St Mary's office, now renamed the hub, will act as a point of contact for all our services. And this is being extended for freight bookings as well as passengers. Moving on to our new vessel project. Uh, following the signing of contracts in January 24, our new vessels remain on track for delivery in 2026. Our project managers, Chris Lingham and Peter Broad, remain at Piru headquarters in France, working on detailed design and class approvals. Our new vessels will deliver a significant improvement to our existing sealing services. Salonium 4, our new passenger ferry, will have capacity for 600 passengers, have increased cargo capacity to date daily fresh goods, will have fin stabilizers and a new whole vein system to improve ride comfort, will reduce journey times, and will have tier three hybrid engines and have been designed to deliver a pass to net zero. Our new cargo vessel will have increased cargo capacity, increased cargo capacity for children frozen goods, and a dedicated passenger lounge for 12 passengers including dedicated onboard facilities. To conclude, our vessels will deliver not just improvements, but a reliable and resilient service which supports the silly economy. Now I'd like to pass over to Judy, who's going to talk about financials. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Stuart. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd just like to run through a few of the key financial points that are in the slide set. We've worked hard over recent years to put the company into a position of strength. Our profit and loss accounts show that we have improved turnover and reduced costs to such an extent that we have generated profits of around 2.5 million per year. Cash has been retained in the company at a level well over 3 million per year. We have a strong balance sheet and have increased net assets year on year. We have paid very little out in dividends, as, as Ian stated, and instead retain cash in the company, allowing us to build up the cash reserves required for the new vessel deposits, which were paid in January. Our fair structure is transparent and prices are set responsibly and sustainably to ensure the longevity of the company's operations. Like all companies, we have had to increase our standard prices in recent years due to the impact of high inflation, which resulted in higher fuel, wage and general supplier costs. However, as Ian said, we have kept day trip fares at the same low price for many years in order to compete with other local attractions and to entice visitors holidaying in the local area to the ship. We have also reinstated the locals offer which enables residents of Cornwall to travel on a day trip at an even lower fare. The tens of thousands of day trip passengers traveling on Salonian each year ensures overall passenger numbers remain high, which in turn supports the island's economy. It is important to emphasize that the Salonian fare for passengers staying on the islands includes a luggage allowance in the price and luggage conveniently travels with the passenger on the same ship. Our Salonian Travel Club rate for Ireland is, is only £26.25 as of March, which is about a 69% discount on our standard fare. This price remains if islands wish to travel on the Grimeritha over winter, 
and therefore there is an all year round sea service available for islanders at a very low price. Aside from our published prices, we also offer numerous discounts to groups and charities each year, as well as passengers traveling to attend island events in order to encourage passengers to the islands. We have been open and transparent about the fare and freight charge increases expected over the next few years in the run up to the introduction of the new vessels. The vast majority of the loan repayments will be paid by the company as a result of the cash generated from our operations. The minimal fare increases remain in accordance with our new vessel communications, which is set at a target rate of 5% plus inflation each year until 2026. However, Islanders will continue to pay the heavily discounted travel club rate, which will only be subject to inflation. Thank you. Stuart, just remind you to finish by half past, please. You're done. Brilliant. Even better. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that. Um, throw it open to members. Uh, has anyone got any questions? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, an easy one to start with. Um, the current Salonian, what's the passenger capacity on it? Uh, so I've heard rumours this morning that uh, there's a rumour circulating that the passenger capacity of Salonian 3 has been reduced. That is not correct. It remains at 485. We've just completed our five year survey, which uh, we've had class of A's and MCA on board. Um, I can absolutely confirm capacity is at 485 and will continue to be at that. Thank you very much. It's good to clear that one up. Thank you. Um, the next question, I suppose, is, is, is the obvious one. You, you're predicting a 5% increase in, in fares plus inflation for the next two or three years. Yeah. Um, obviously, with the impact of competition potentially on the route, um, how can you guarantee that? Is it a guarantee? Um, obviously, there's going to be an impact on your revenue if you're in competition with another operator. So can I get some clarity on that, please? Um, obviously, you know, there is competition entering, but we're very very clear and very um, happy and content with the service and the prices that we offer. We're very transparent about um, our prices. Um, we have a very good relationship with our financial providers, Lombard NetWest. We do uh, cash flow forecasts well over 12 months. If there were considered to be any any concerns at any point, we would obviously discuss it with them. Um, but we, we remain very confident about the service and the cash generation and the passenger numbers that we all retain in the company. No, thank you, Chairman. Uh, just a question on the environmental impact of the new ship. I mean, marine pollution is one of the worst um, pollution uh, in, in the world with uh, black carbon, as it's known, sulfur and nitrogen compounds, which are not just in the sea, but also in the atmosphere as well. And um, I just wondered about any plans to replace diesel engines, uh, because uh, you mentioned uh, in your in in your address that, um, uh, that it would be environmentally friendly. Well, how so if it's still powered by diesel? And secondly, um, are there any plans to replace that system to a more modern propulsion system, such as hydrogen or electricity? Yeah, very happy to take that question. Uh, the um, the shipping industry is is very much in a situation where it uh, doesn't have a path in terms of what the future fuel is going to be. Is it going to be batteries? Is it going to be hydrogen or some other fuel type? <clears throat> Selenium 4 has been designed that the propulsion system can be adapted. So as well as having tier three engines, which are going to uh, significantly reduce nitrous oxides, which is one of the heaviest pollutants, um, it is being built to be adapted. So whatever the fuel type of the future can be, um, it can be uh, the propulsion system can be connected to a containerized fuel cell, which can be lowered onto Selenium 4 and effectively plugged in. So when the industry decides what the propulsion fuel will be of the future, we can readily adapt to that without having to significantly change the engine setup. Um, likewise, uh, Lioness Lady 2 will be an aluminium catamaran design much lighter 
and at equivalent speeds will reduce the fuel burn by 50%. So again, significantly reducing emissions. And they will also be tier three engines reducing harmful nitrous oxides. Uh, I'll go again. Um, so I'm the lead member for housing and um, corporate estate over here. So you touched on um, capacity for getting building materials over here. And obviously one of the main issues we have um, building anything over here is the cost of freight. Um, I'm really pleased to hear that you're going to have an out-of-town depot. That that ticks a massive box. But you talked about increasing the capacity. Um, how are you going to do that? So uh, we are part of the Alza Silly Infrastructure Group. Uh, we recognise that there is going to be a peak over the coming years in terms of uh, freight capacity. Um, we are foreseeing the need to increase that capacity and therefore we're actively searching for um, bringing in additional tonnage to meet that capacity demand. We're already seeing the GRI um, being maxed out, particularly on deck over the, the peak sailing seasons, and therefore we are looking to seriously looking to address that capacity issue by bringing in additional tonnage. By additional tonnage, you mean another vessel? Correct. Thank you. And is that for this season or for in the future? Imminently. In a week's time, we could be more specific, but it's not appropriate to be more specific at this point. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I don't think, I mean, I'm, you've got your figures here, and uh, they're quite quite healthy. I mean, well done. Um, about thirteen percent profit. Now, that's is that not quite high for a transport company? It just seemed quite a lot to me. I and mean, obviously, the, from your perspective, the higher it is, the better. But thirteen percent seems quite a lot. And I also note that I'm not going to go through any of it. But really, that you did the, the actual quote you've got here is that the ceiling operation will be restricted to a reasonable. The profits will be restricted to a reasonable level. Now, reasonable level. Seem is, is that's what it is. It's reasonable. I mean, but not not reasonable is implies excess or mon mon monopolistic profits. And I just thought it was quite an odd thing to put out that you one of the reasons you rejected the laugh is because your profits would have been reject um re sorry reduced to a reasonable level. You see where I'm coming from. You don't want that. Reasonable profits were unacceptable to you because you have to subsidise Skybus. We understand that. But it went above it, but that means that everybody who just uses the boat and the freight service is subsidising an airline, which is perhaps um, slightly problematic to see and how dependent we are on the freight services. I, mean, I completely mucked that up. I'm sorry. I hope you got the gist of what I was saying. Just, just taking your first point, Steve. Um, obviously, back in 2019, when we started the new vessel project, uh, we we had an intention of increasing cash so that we could fund de uh, deposits on the new vessels. And you'll see from our accounts, that, you know, we we have improved profits, not just through increasing turnover, but reducing costs so that we retain that level of profit and hence the level of cash to build ourselves up into a position to be able to pay those deposits. So that was our strategy over the last five years to be able to generate profits and hence cash to be able to pay the deposits on the vessel. So that's the first point. And the second point is obviously in relation to, you know, Skybus. Skybus is very hungry in terms of capital expenditure. It really is. There's enormous expenditure on engines and the, the aircraft generally. Um, and as we've always maintained, you know, it's the marine side that, that funds the capital expenditure that you don't necessarily see um, in the accounts necessarily on, on Skybus. So, you know, it, it really is very cash hungry Skybus. Um, and so that's why, you know, it really was felt that the level of profit that seems reasonable wasn't enough to um, meet the commitment of Skybus over the coming years. Yeah, no, I accept that. I mean, the point really was that 13 percent profit is perhaps one of the reasons why another company could think, oh, well, there's, there's some room there for us, if you get my drift, because it is quite high. Sorry, are you saying 13 or 30? 13. 13. 13. OK, and, and you, what have you done? Have you taken profit before tax as a percentage? Well, I just about 19 million turnover and okay, just, just a percentage. percentage so I've just divided 
I'm just going from the figures here. I understand that. I mean, it's, it's I mean, I, you wouldn't expect me to say anything else, but it's it's a pretty normal sort of ratio. For, I, I've just sort yeah. of asked, I have asked around, and it's it's, it's, it's a reasonably, uh, quite a high level of property profit for a for a public transport operator, but, but you know, fair enough, that's what you, you're doing. But all I was pointing out was that if it is quite a high level of property, it does mean that perhaps other people would think, oh, well, we want a bit of that. We, we, we accept that, Steve, but we've, the company have been doing this for 104 years. We've worked extremely hard to put in procedures and service improvements to get to that level of profitability. As Judith said, it's not about just increasing ticket prices. Anybody can come in and do that. Running a, a transport operation is highly complex. It's very much safety focused and is very, very difficult to start from day one. And I, uh, I, I really do believe it will be a challenge for any operator thinking they can just come in and provide a resilient and robust service as we have done for the past 104 years. OK. Uh, <clears throat> Um, so, um, Ian spoke about the company being run a little bit on CIC, community interest company grounds, much the same as I do outside these four walls. Um, and I think my sort of question would be how much, and it's just an estimation, would you be able to reduce fares on the ceiling service in the summer? similar to your, perhaps your competitor coming in, if you didn't run by that ethos? And how much would you be able to reduce fares if you, for example, no longer operate Skybus? The point I'm trying to drive at is how much, sub, you spoke about subsidy in your, in your um, discussion point, how much subsidy would we require to enable you to reduce fares in the summer to perhaps more equitable for our passengers, which would then enable growth in the market, maybe a bit more exponentially than we currently have due to cost of living prices. The costs for transport are going up across the board, you know, train, train tickets going up eight, nine, ten percent in some places. So my question is really, if you were to ditch your CIC credentials, just run purely on a commercial basis. What's the gap between that and what you strive to do, which is run a CIC system? Hopefully that makes sense if you understand where I'm going. I, perhaps I should deal with the CIC thing first. There's a there's a sort of um, a common misunderstanding about CICs and so on and how they work. Uh, but I I, I happen to know a bit about about one and I'll tell you how it works and I'll tell you why I think that our operation looks quite similar to the CIC. Um, the other part of your question about how much would it take, I think we we probably don't have a number we can just give you. We'd have to sit around the table and say, uh, you know, with, all, with, with Judith and all her and all her accounts and say, well, if we applied for this, we could, yeah. you know, but um, the way a, a community, CIC means community interest company. The way it works is that, for, first of all, you have to have social enterprise type objectives, which I believe we we, we do up to a, a, a point because we're providing lifeline services um, for the Isles of Scilly. So that, that fundamentally sounds a bit like a social enterprise objective to me, although you might argue that some of the things we do are not lifeline. Um, like the logistics business side of the carriers, for example, and that sort of thing. And the tourist business is not lifeline either uh, as, as such. But, but assuming you can um, identify an objective that qualifies as um, a community interest objective, what, what happens then is that the company still runs to make a profit, but the profit has to be, by and large, I think it's 50% or 75% of the profit you make has to be kept in the company and not, and not paid out as a dividend so that the money that you make can be reinvested in the business and 
and then in pursuance of your social enterprise type objectives it can continue to grow and you can do more and more well well we're, we're, we're actually doing that as we said we we haven't paid a dividend for the last two or three years we've paid a dividend once in the last five and all the money has been kept in the company so that we can continue to serve silly with new vessels in in the future so if we had been registered as a community interest company actually we'd have still been doing exactly the same things and conducting ourselves in the same way why can't we convert into a community interest company it might be another question that occurs to you well the answer is that we would need 75% uh, of the shareholders to vote in favor of that and the fact of the matter is that now we don't have as many islander shareholders as we used to um, we've still got 250 or whatever the number is something like that judith isn't it but um but the number of shares which they vote isn't more than about a third of the total share capital and we wouldn't be able to rely on mainland shareholders some of whom have bought um, shares with a view to a kind of long-term uh, investment return uh, we wouldn't be able to I, I don't think get their agreement to to do that because at some point those those shareholders are looking for you know to to exit and get a return on their investment so I, ho I hope that helps a bit on community interest companies mm. uh, just to sort of pick up on John's other point um, aviation is very much uh, loss making throughout the winter months and I certainly think air subsidies is something we want to work with the council to explore uh, we have raised a paper at the local transport board meeting which the council attends uh, to um, put a proposal together uh, with our partners on the transport board to seek air subsidies particularly around either uh, St Mary's Airport um, to address both their operational costs which would be a revenue subsidy or through their uh, capital replacement fund which would be a, uh, a capital subsidy um, as Ian has already mentioned the the landing fees particularly now that the uh, council have increased charges by 18 percent make up 20 percent of our total airfare with continued increases of that level, it is going to become increasingly expensive. And I would certainly challenge back the council to work with us um, on exploring those aviation subsidies. It's something which um, the chair and I have been in London in the past seven days discussing with government officials about seeking revenue opportunities, particularly on the aviation side. Um, but the time to act is really now if certainly the council were concerned about the affordability of transport, we really need to work together quite quickly on this. John, do you want to? Like yeah, to one, just one more question. Um, on the advisory board, um, there is a possible conflict that we need to investigate from the council side, which precludes members from sitting on the advisory board. If uh, Simon is on the call, but this is not for now, Simon, but at a later time, if we can hold internal council discussions, do you have any issues with councillors having a place on your advisory board? No, absolutely not. We welcome it. Okay. Great idea. Steve, do you want to come? Yeah, I just think I should come back in on the 18% um, airport charge increases, which was regrettable, but um, council lost i'm losing track of the figure it's sort of varied a bit between 250,000 and 300,000 pounds last year on the airport that comes out of council tax it's not sustainable now i absolutely agree we need to operators and the council and the government need to find a way forward on this but frankly we hummed and hard about it we really didn't want to pay well, actually the initial the initial figure was i think 23 percent we dropped it as much as we could and i was sort of the question to you on that basis in that situation, what would you have done? Is it really it, the, the, vi the future viability of the airport is very much at stake at the moment. So, and I agree, it's a problem for you, but it's also a problem for us. And it was it was a problem, we, a regrettable solution. I, I absolutely agree, Steve. But the, the problem is, is that this is not a new issue. That the airport has struggled for the past ten years. Skybus has barely broken even, and we're forecast to make significant losses again for this forthcoming season. 
we you know we've talked about this now for 10 years in terms of the, the struggles around St Mary's Airport and having to increase fees exponentially every single year it's only going to get worse I just referred to my previous point that we need to start talking about this seriously now and approach government urgently to discuss it it can't wait any longer I, I absolutely agree and I think that's something we can definitely come together and sort out because we need numbers in excess of 95,000 coming in to make it great even if we're not getting them then the money either comes from you the passengers or the cash taxpayer or ideally from government so that's what we need to look at there's something else I just wanted to address a, a, a one point in here um you sort of say about the 4951 you say that the council rejected that I don't think the council ever formally made a decision on that it was firmly rejected by the Department for Transport with a letter from Baroness Fear in March 22, where they, she, she said it didn't address levelling up, which was always the council's position, but we never formally rejected it. That's I thought it's worth mentioning. OK, Councillor Dean. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, airport issues, absolutely. We seem to be in a downward spiral. The numbers go down, we put the prices up, numbers go down, we put the prices up, numbers go down, we, you know, we're going to end up with I don't know what we're going to end up with, nothing. And then and then we're in all sorts of bother. So absolutely, we need to work together on that. Absolutely welcome that. Uh, also welcome all your, all your new initiatives that you talked about, you know, the out-of-town freight, we've already mentioned, St Mary's Hub, um, online check-in. You definitely do more kind of customer-focused stuff at the moment and the advisory, reintroduction of the advisory board, that's all fantastic. Um, now, if I was a very cynical man, <laughs> I was, and you know, we want to be open and honest with you. You talked about, you know, trust, building the trust back and all the rest of it. You've been, it, it seems a quite a cynical move from, from the community viewpoint that because there's a new kid on the block that is offering, you know, well, they're coming in later, we'll find out what they're offering, that you kind of upped your game because of that. Um, and we do all remember the kind of debacles of the past, I don't know if any of you were involved with the old helicopter service and the, and the Marley Rose and, you know, the kind of, dare I say, mismanagement of the company. Now, clearly, the company's turned a corner, clearly a much more successful company, much better run, dare I say. But um, I guess the question is that if the other player walks away, their competition is gone, what kind of guarantees can you give us that these these improved service levels, these improved offers that you're giving us now, continue. As a as a very cynical man, sorry. I, I think your I think your cynicism is um, is completely understood. Um, I I think competition. I, I think I use the expression keeps you on your toes, and I, and I think that um, the potential competition we haven't actually seen it yet, obviously. Um, Quite like to sit in on the next meeting to understand exactly what it's going to look like but I, I, I think it has played a part in accelerating some of the service improvements that you just referred to. I'm, I'm not saying they wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, I, I think the increased island representation and the new advisory board and the greater engagement with the community generally uh, would have brought about uh, all of those service improvements uh, anyway uh, and and we're still a, a relatively young not not me obviously but um, Stuart and Judith a relatively young uh, dynamic uh, executive team so I, I I think the service improvements would have come but perhaps not quite as as quickly in terms of guarantees <laughs> I can't give you any sort of cast iron guarantees but whilst I'm whilst I'm chair I'm pretty confident that our our board, looking at Sam as well for uh, um, approbation, as it were. I think our board would make would make sure that those service improvements would continue, and and that we would continue to look for further service improvements. Would you say so? Yeah. so it's about time you said something. Yes, isn't it's it? just yeah. say what I, you think. I, yeah. th there's a number of other initiatives that we'll be looking to continually address and challenge Stuart and Judith as a board. We'll challenge them to to keep introducing, keep looking at improving the service. There's been a couple of the, the two big issues have obviously been vessel replacement and now we've got the competition and whilst we were building up our cash reserves in order to fund the new vessels it's obviously a big investment for us and as such perhaps there was more reluctance 
for monitors off as we pushed four and out of ten freight depot. Um, uh, the online check-in has come in separately as well. But perhaps um, we're conflating the two issues that it, we wanted to get to a point where we knew what that deposit was going to be on the new ships. Or we can start going for the, I'm not saying it's the nice to have, they're very important, but there had to be a priority. List. And so we had to ensure that we could get the new vessels with all the benefits they're going to generate secured before we start doing that. But we're in that position now. We're a profitable company that can look the right, the right extra service service sum for all our customers. Uh, we've got five minutes left, so if we can make yeah, sure the questions are quick. I was going to bring out the competition, but I think that's been dealt with. I was, I'm just just like to say I'm I'm quite intrigued with the notion of Judith and Stuart being the dynamic duo. It makes you think of Batman and Robin, really. But, <laughs> but anyway, I have a question. It was it's been sent in to me actually. It's uh, um, did the steamship company um, work through their financial model uh, or the council's financial model for the SPV with the council? I, I sort of know the answer to this, but I think it's worth asking. Yeah, did you, um, get, um, obviously there was an SPV model which which ne was never developed. Did you ever work through that with the council or have discussions with the council on it? Because to my knowledge, you, there were a lot of requests for it and it never happened. We had numerous meetings with the council throughout really the last three years, haven't we? You know, there's been lots of meetings that we've attended with Nigel, Paul, various other people. Um, and it's been, you know, a constant discussion really throughout all that time. So trying to get levelling up funding to work. Obviously, there was a, a significant change halfway through that where it turned out not to be a grant, not owning the vessels to uh, really, you know, um, you know, becoming a tender every five years, not owning the vessels and having to make a payment, a significant payment. Um, but all through that period, uh, you know, we had really good conversations obviously i was doing the modeling from the spv side of things as well as running uh, what it would look like from a private finance point of view um so the conversations never really stopped you know uh, with with the council trying to push through this um leveling up funding to make it work we also had meetings with the department for transport uh, numerous meetings with them so it was an ongoing conversation really um but it just it just wasn't right for our company and and as ian said it may never have come to fruition really um we just couldn't couldn't wait any longer um it's far far too much risk for for many reasons uh, and that's why we decided to go with uh private finding in the end but the conversation never stopped up to that point well we're gonna have to finish now but that um i would I have got limited experience with working with government, but from my, my impression that the DFT and dealer and landing up, they, they bent over backwards to try and get this over the line. And it's a, and I, it's a shame it didn't happen. But I do think, I think this is one of the levelling up things that would have got through, given the amount of effort the government put in. Thank you. Um, John? Just very quickly, um, try to end on a positive note. Can you clarify that your shipbuilding project is on time and when are you expecting us to see your, your nice new shiny ship in the islands please so um as i've stated chris and peter are out in concarneau in france now they're going through the detailed design process we're looking to uh imminently cut steel um and then kill laying uh, further this year um but plans are proceeding on track and we're looking at delivering vessels in 2026. Jay, if I can just come back to Steve's last. You've got, you yeah, know, no, I, was, I just, and it is a positive note. Obviously the conversation. Make it very that, quick, please. Very quick. The conversation we had with the DFT last week was extremely positive about the company in terms of the new build project and about the Isle of Scilly itself. So I do think there is a very, and continues to be a good relationship with the department. Thank you very much. Avril. Um, yes, I'd just like to say um, this is the, it's only a comment, it's not a question. Um, I'm just hoping that we can all move forward now and uh, work with you to uh, get the transport um, on track somewhere along the line. And I hope this will happen soon. And I'd also like you, I'm sure 
um, Dan's going to say thank you as well, but I'd like to thank you as well for coming. Thank you. Brilliant. And with that, I think we'll stop the questions there. Just really quick questions. Very quick. Really? One word. Really? Answers. Just just two two very quick questions. Uh, one, what will the wave height threshold be for the new vessel? And two, um, how many double sailings are you realistically planning? Very quick. Sorry. Uh, the, the vessel will um, operate in significant wave heights. There is not a level in terms of it has to be this level. It's always at the master's discretion. What I will say is this vessel has been designed exactly around the steel plating frame spacing of Salonian 3. So it'll be extremely robust, extremely reliable. Uh, as we've already said, it's already got 100% service uptime over the past 12 months. This vessel will be exactly the same. It will not be deterred by um, you know, poor weather as, as other vessels may well be. What is that roughly though, Stuart? Just I mean, we're looking, I mean, Salonian will easily handle over four metre wave heights, but obviously then it becomes about looking after passengers and whether it's right to go. Microphone. We're looking at implementing a number of double sailings. What, how many more double sailings? It, well, again, it depends on harbour approval. So it's uh, it wouldn't be right for me to say at this point. Okay, and that is that the dynamic timetabling you're talking about? That's what that means is if slots are available, you'll fill them. Okay, thank you. With that, I'd like to thank the Steamship Company for attending this meeting and the information uh, that you've given us. Um, we'll close the meeting there. No, you need to move. We, we need to no, move. no, not yet. With it, we'll close this portion of the meeting now. <laughs> And um, thank you very much. If we could stop the recording for the moment, that'd be great.
just so you're aware on the call, Chairman has decided that we'll be coming back at about 10 past to carry on with the meeting for those online.
I'm going to not speak. Yeah, okay. Special. Okay, off we go. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, we'll start the recording again now, please. We're welcome to part two. Uh, the delegation from Holland and Wolf are here. Um, I'd like to just hand over to John if you'd like to start your presentation, please. Perfect. Thank you very much, and uh, really appreciate you welcoming me here today um, with Julian and Beth. Um, I've been coming across to the Sillies now for about six months um, back and forward and I'm glad to say it's a f the first time that the sun's been shining so hopefully uh, it's a good afternoon for everybody. 
Um, I've got 45 minutes, um, I believe, for the first session. That'll take you through some, some slides. Um, I'll try and not kill you with death by PowerPoint, um, but let's see where we uh, where we get to. So I think look, <clears throat> the Harland and Wolf Group um, talking about where we are as a, a bigger business. Um, I came into the business um, just under five years ago. Prior to that, I started off my career as an engineer and officer in the Merchant Navy. Um, went from there into ship superintendency, running ships, charting ships, charting passenger vessels, um, and doing quite a lot um, on bringing passenger vessels into service. Um, moved from there into the oil and gas industry. Again, a lot of chart and operation, operating vessels. Spent some time out in Australia, um, then came back into the UK to uh, get Harland and Wolf moving and get up and running um, through a company called Infrastrata. So we sort of moved on the strategy with, that we put together at the time was operating um, in five markets, which was defence, cruise and ferry, oil and gas, renewables and commercial maritime. Um, by having the five markets, you're really diversifying your business um, and on the services that we provide to those markets um, is everything from the beginning of the project life cycle, engineering design, um, fabrication um, and shipbuilding through to in-service support, marine services and vessel operations, um, through to decommissioning um, and big conversion projects. So it's really a, a, mi a mixture of what we do. So we spent the first three years um, building the business um, from where it was. We started off with 42 employees. We're now over 1,300 permanent employees in the group. And at the moment, we've got 3,500 people in the shipyards. So I think we, we've sort of grown um, fairly quickly. Probably recently, the, the export orders have started to kick in. With a, It was interesting to see the tie-in with the, the Falkland Islands um, recently around the school and the secondary education. We've just won a contract, um, and we're, sorry, we're preferred bidder, um, on a contract down in the Falkland Islands to replace the port and the infrastructure um, down there. So I think that this, the small um, community and the island communities is something that um, we, we, we are focusing on. So I think move on to the business where, where we are today and where we're going with it. I think the market projections we've put out is for revenues this year, last year um, that will announce in the next few weeks between 18 and 100 million. Um, the projection for 2024 is 200 million. Um, and then we've stated our aspirations to get the general group um, to 500 million across all our markets and services. So I think when you look at um, the, the, the silly project for us, it starts off as a, um, our entry in, into that vessel operation management piece. Um, we don't see it being restricted to the, the, the Isles of Scilly. We see that ranging a lot further and a lot wider um, than just the Scillies through time. And I think as you get more operation, you get more resilience in your operations and, and you get things moving along. So I think when you look at the the, the silly proposition, um, it, it really be becomes interesting um, along the, the the piece. But we'll just start on a short video first, if we can get this to play through your system. It just gives you a bit of background about Harland and Wolf. This may or may not give us full. No, we can't get the volume, but I think as we go through, um, I'll just talk you through some of the key elements to this. So it's just taking you through some of the historics. I think there was once 30,000 people that, that worked in the shipyard group. Um, so I think, you know, it went down to 40 odds. And I think it's about communities that used to rely um, on support and service. And it's the way it's come back through and rebuilt itself. And we see a lot of similarities um, in the journey uh, that, that we are going on here. And I think, you know, we've got four sites around the UK, one in Arnish, um, up in the Outer Hebrides, um, which again is, is an island community. And I think it's about bringing this modern technology into what we are doing and what we are offering. Um, and you'll have seen recently the large fleet solid support contract uh, that we've got a substantial chunk of work on with uh, our Spanish partners, Navantia which you'll see the pictures on the screen here. And again, large passenger vessels uh, and ferries, high-speed crafts for Stena and that sort of thing, where it's a day-to-day -day 
um, part of our business that, that, that we're ongoing with as we speak. And I think the FPSO you see in the dry dock, we've got that in at the moment um, for a contract value. I think we announced the market is 65 million. So it's all fairly big, um, big, big chunky stuff as we go through. And it's really looking at that. This is Appledore Shipyard down in Devon. Um, again, it's looking at that next generation of shipbuilding. And I'll come on to where that may play into to what we're do, doing down here um, as things uh, move on. And I think, you know, you look at the number of apprentices that you've seen throughout this video. We've now got 250 apprentices in the business. And I think bringing one of the things we found was that whole skill set was lost um, when we acquired the yard. And we've had to really boost it on um, to actually regrow and regenerate the skills of the future. And I think that's something that we're fairly passionate about and we have been investing in um, for the past four years. And I think our business model that we started off on was a five year um, break even um, piece uh, and making money after that five years. So you don't just regenerate and regrow four shipyards that have been in, in, in administration um, overnight. It, it does take a bit of time. So I think if you look at the markets that I was talking about in the sectors, the markets are on the left, um, the sectors are on the right. So it's that complete project life cycle management piece. Um, you look through and the business model that we've got is fairly proven. We're sort of de developing and building the business on the back of a, a solid foundations and solid platform with some world class assets. And the key to everything we do really is all about value for money. So I think when you look at the, the, the vessel in the picture here is Harland and Wolf Sampson. That's a new vessel um, to the fleet that Julian picked up. Um, it felt like in the middle of nowhere up in Scotland on a, a, a cold uh, winter's morning. Um, so she came down to Appledore. Um, she's bigger than the existing um, fleet of vessels um, that, that we've got. Do you want to talk a little bit about Sampson, Julian? Yeah, so obviously we... Uh picked it up early this year. Um, she went down in to have a, have a refit of, of a small um, fit out inside. She's no stranger to the islands, as some of you may recognise her anyway, back in the day. Um, she was called under a different name. She takes double the amount of freight that is currently on the Terramar, so she can carry up to 100 tonne of deck cargo on her. Um, she has um, power outlets, a deck for reef for storage, for cold and ambient foods. Um, she also has a large crane on there, which is is very, very versatile. Um, 100 ton meter crane, which means that she can lift 17 ton close in and up to 3.7 ton at 20 meters. So if needs be, we can, we can uh, also spud the boat off the quay. Um, she has two spud legs, which means you've got a pole on the front of the boat and a pole on the back, so she can create a a stable platform away from any structures, which you don't need to 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 hinder any, any performance from any other vessels going into a quay. Um, she's 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 perfect for what she is for coming into the islands here to supply into infrastructure projects and also um, general freight and cargo as well. Um, she will be working alongside the Terramar. Currently, she's due to arrive shortly uh, and put her straight into service for moving general freight to and from um, Penzance to, to the Isles of Scilly. Yeah. Perfect. Thank yeah. Thanks for that, Julian. Um, so if you look at where we are, really, we, we started off on the journey, really, with the, the, the problem statement that we had back from as early as 2023, um, Really, a lot of the work before we take on programmes and take on projects is looking at where that vessel will go into service, how it will operate and things things like that. So we spent a lot of time looking at the vessels and the size of vessels to say, right, how can we get something that's optimised? And I think, you know, that the poor service and operation, you know, the seasonal but not optimised for peak demand, the, the bit of a complete lack of strategic vision in the vessels and the fleet, and I think the view of replacing existing vessels um, with new vessels that are exactly the same, we just saw it, it was a bit bizarre given the advances in technology and why you would go with fewer vessels, slower service, 
um, and not taking advantage of the, the future that could be built and the really interesting things that could be done. And I think the, the, the freight needs for the islands today are completely different um, from what we saw in the past. Um, and I think, you know, the, the consultation events that we did really highlighted the, the need for, you know, regularity um, in those journeys, you know, not once every three days, uh, not once every other day. It's that regular all throughout the year, weather permitting, of actually getting goods and services and passengers in. And I think the events of this week with the disruptions to the helicopter and the, the, the air freight, sorry, the, the, the airplanes really just brings in a clear focus that there is big issues. And I think the Sea Link provides a, a pivotal link for that. So I think we, we expressed a view uh, around the levelling up fund. Um, we went away from the, the big passenger ship and the uh, separate cargo ship completely and said what we really need is two vessels, one departing from um, St Mary's every morning, one de departing from Penzance every morning, um, crossing over in the middle um, to make sure that that regular um, freight and passenger run w was moving. <clears throat> and I think rather than separate ships, that was the optimum, a row park so that you had rear access to get um, things on and off the vessel um, and allowing for future key sides, future facility development, so that you're not locking yourself into historical failures um, and that you're actually looking to the future with a future vision to make things better. And I think with with the levelling up, we, we find it devastating, to be fair, for everybody that lives um, operates and visits the island that that amount of money after all the good work that was done has been thrown down the drain. Um, we saw it as something that was really life changing um, for everybody that was here to keep the cost of living uh, at an acceptable um, level. But look, we, we are where we are. We understand um, why it's now off the table. Um, and we look to the future and I think we've taken our plans from the initial um, where we were We've rejigged them, we've rejigged them, and we've rejigged them with the changing circumstances that have come um, into the fast ferry um, that, that we've, both Julia and I were on board um, last Friday in Barcelona, uh, where the vessel's coming out the water that I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, she's getting a new um, paint job done so that when she arrives here um, in the next few weeks for buffing trials and pilot ex exemption certificates, um, she'll be good to uh, to go into service. Um, but I think in addition to that, the, the, the freight operations, we've really had a, a long, hard look at. <clears throat> and from instead of concentrating just on the, the two landing crafts, um, we've then got a, a mix into freight. We've got a mix into summer and winter. So what I mean by that is the fast ferry will run um, May till September. Um, and again, we're not saying when we introduce that service, everything will be um, as it will be by the end of the season. There will be tweaks, there will be changes, there will be things done differently as we learn from the lessons and get some feedback. But one of the, the major weaknesses we do see is come the winter, um, when the fast ferry stops running, the Salonian stops running, um, there is that area where the aircrafts don't fly, the helicopters don't fly and the sea state is suitable to let vessels travel. So we have also acquired a crew transfer vessel that's been refurnished at the moment that will hold up to 20, 24 passengers, the same type of vessel that's used on offshore wind farms. And it will take a 20 foot container um, full of cargo on the back at the same time. So that's the service we intend to operate all year round so that we're actually getting that mix of passengers. We're not just turning our back come the winter months. We're actually saying, hey, we think this service is needed in the winter. So there's that constant um, push on um, passengers. So on the freight side, when we talk about the, the, the long term, we look at the um, two landing crafts. There'll probably be a third um, and potentially a fourth landing craft um, as we move on given the projects and given the um, heavy intensity of projects. But one of the things that you have to look at when you're looking at this project work, it will be here today, it won't be here tomorrow. Part of our business model is not just to focus on Scilly, it's to focus on projects in the southwest. So when there is lots of projects in Scilly, we can bring the vessels here. When the work takes off, 
then we take the project boats and we go elsewhere with them. So you've not got boats that are sitting around doing nothing. What we do see is really critical is two dedicated freight vessels, um, smaller that are running every day back and forward, one leaving this side, one leaving that side, ploughing its trade, going back and forward. So I think that's something we don't have those vessels at the moment. We're looking out for tonnage on the market. Um, and that is something that we'll either buy the tonnage, we'll convert it, or we'll look to do. And I think we've also looked at new build designs for that. But again, when you look at the business model, um, and that's probably the thing that's completely changed since the start of this process till now, I think all our vessels are older, second-hand tonnage, um, cheap to operate, low engine costs, low um, labour costs to man. Um, the, you know, the market's going to get pretty competitive down here. And I think uh, I've heard a few comments around competition. Um, so, well, we don't need competition and competition's a bad thing. Well, I think, look at look at all the things that's happened and we've only been here for six months. You know, there's new ticket and booking systems coming in. You know, there's new um, freight websites coming in. Um, and I think you only have to see the changes that have been made in the market in general to say competition is a good thing and competition works. Um, so we, we continue to, to carry on down that route. So I think the, the freight side of it, um, Julian will talk about and answer some questions on that um, as we go along. But I think that's one of the bits that is fundamental as we move forward. Um, and I think when you look at the need and the volume of stuff, it's about actually getting that in. So I think we only had a conversation in the last week around using some of the major program experience we've got in Harland and Wolf in the planning department um, to look at some of the major infrastructure projects that's going, going on here um, and looking at the, the logic paths and the critical path analysis for getting that amount of freight across and to the correct location so it's not getting moved twice, three times, putting onto the quayside in St Mary's when it doesn't even need to go near the quayside. So I think there's quite a bit of work we're doing with some of the major contractors to say, hey, how can we do things differently here to the extent that we were talking about fabrication sections um, of steel and that to make entrances into areas so it doesn't make the, the route so arduous to get to where it needs to get to. Um, so when you look at the, the, the objectives that we've got really um, when we go through and why we see the fast ferry as a, a, a good thing, I think it's really about, you know, giving the islanders, the people that work here, live here, visit here, flexibility and options. I think it's often that dedicated service in peak season when the demand's there. It's looking at the day trip market. And I think one of the things we've published so far um, is a schedule with one crossing a day. That is not our intention as we go forward. We do intend to get that up to a minimum of two crossings a day um, as time goes on. But there's been quite a lot of negotiations back and forward with the, the harbour authorities um, to make sure we get a schedule that works. So we've got a start in that area. Um, the vessel that we have, one of the bits of feedback we took um, around the vessel was to say it's too big um, for, for operating in the turnaround speeds that we want. So we went back out, we re-looked at the vessel we had. We've gone down in size a little bit, which lets you go down and draft a little bit, which then lets us operate um, on more of an extended window frame than what we had. Um, so we've gone through and done that exercise probably over the last um, three months. So I think it's really looking at you know, getting people home, getting people back. We've set up the local residence scheme, um, again, which, which shows our commitment here. We've invested heavily in time, effort, um, and the resources into getting the offering that we've got on the table so far. But clearly, until we have a ferry that's coming around the pier end, um, nobody will believe it until they see it. And I think that's... Uh, one of the reasons we're getting a nice shiny paint job done before we arrive so that she uh, she looks good when everybody has a look at her for the first time, you know. Um, so how, how will it operate? As I said, um, May, to, May to October, May to September, um, transit time, um, 90 minutes, um, 30 minute turnaround. There's been a lot of speculation around is 30 minutes long enough to turn around a fast ferry? Well, it's fast by its name, it's fast by its uh, terminology, 
we intend just to have hand luggage only on the ferry, um, on, off, and we'll have an additional freight vessels um, sailing daily. If there is additional freight to come, the additional freight and luggage can go on the uh, can go on the, the freight vessels. What we will look at in the future um, is potentially adding in a crane onto the back of the vessel. So as they do in Rottnest Island in Australia, they've got pods to lift on and lift off luggage pods with a crane. We may look at that in the future. But I think it's keeping it simple, keeping it unique um, and getting operational. And I think one of the things we've not done is we've not made a major publicity blitz. We've not spent a fortune on advertising. We're going for a slow start, um, get the thing up and running, um, get passengers on there, see if there's any issues, learn from the issues rather than starting the service, having a whole load of issues, then having the full ship. So we're kind of taking a soft start approach to get up and running. The website and ticketing has been up, the bookings have been fairly strong um, so far. So I think look, we're in a, a fairly relaxed position on where we are. Um, again, time scale, sea state is one of the things that's uh, always a, a bone of contention with fast ferries um, and all ships and I think you know the, uh, a lot of people have the view that the, the seas are around the islands are like no seas any place else in the world. Um, I think we've got a, a slightly different view. I think like there's challenging sea conditions, there's challenging areas, um, but it's still seawater um, and it's still pilotage. I think, you know, we, we look at the vessels and the technology involved in vessels, uh, where we are today has come on a, a hell of a long way um, from where it started out. So rather than sticking wall technology, we're all for endorsing new technology. When you look at the, the vessels that are in operation, um, there's fast ferries run um, into wave heights of uh, six metres in certain places of the country. We've got no intention operating in those kind of conditions. We see um, that the vessels uh, certified by the classification society to 4.1 metres will take a view of between two and a half and three metres um, a swell um, to operate to begin with and see see where we go. And that will be obviously in conjunction with MCA as the vessels given its passenger certificate. For us, it's it's not all about the button through all weather and just getting people there. It's about the enjoyableness of the journey so that people actually enjoy the experience and want to get back on. Uh, I certainly don't want the reputation of a spew bucket um, as we move forward. I want a vessel that people enjoy um, getting on, have an experience, have that short 90-minute uh, crossing. Obviously, if weather does dictate that it's uh, a slower crossing, we'll be slowing down a bit to make the journey more pleasurable than trying to make the uh, make the crossing time. So I think the, the fares and the schedules, as I spoke about, the, the schedule is up there. To begin with, we, we have overnight early morning departures here from St Mary's, um, and we've got some across on the mainland. The key is really to expand this and actually get more of those um, as we go forward. And we're working on that now. So the website over the next three, four weeks will be updated with a, a more fuller schedule. Um, our ticketing system, um, we've started off with a it's tried and tested system that we've been building. We had a few issues um, with that process, getting the credit cards linked in and everything like that. Um, so we were a bit slower than launching the tickets than we wanted to be. We've started off with a, an easy jet type system that sets the, the, the lowest tickets first. Then as the demand um, picks up and the number of tickets you've got available, the, the prices um, do creep up on the tickets. And it's really the, the early value gets, the early bird gets the best value um, on the ticket price. So far, the demand's been uh, really strong. We've got rid of all the, all the bogus bookings of a, a random 100 tickets for uh, XXX and places like that. So we, we, we've we got the sophistication in the ticket system to uh, figure out who's an accurate buyer and who's not, um, so that we won't get the boat filled full of random bookings. Um, so I think when you look at where we are, it's really in partnership with Salonians. It's really looking at, you know, how can we do things to make things better? How can we make um, life better? You know, we've got the residence club that, that we think is a really good deal. It's fair value. 
um, and we've extended that for kids in education um, on the mainland are still getting that ability to come back um, and get tickets. They're still getting that ability to come back and actually see what's happening, um, spend some time with the family and get home. Like we've all all got kids. I think get, getting them home and seeing them um, is really valuable. And I think it embolds what we do as part of the community. And I think we, we were a bit disappointed um, before Christmas when we, we stepped in to sort the freight crisis out um, that everybody was just ignoring. Uh, we laid on the, the Terramar um, for free, no charges, only to find out that nobody got any discounts on the on their freight, um, despite us bringing 60% of the freight across. So I think, you know, we, we look in the working and the, the benefit and the spirit of the community, um, and I think that has to really go always and everybody looking at pulling together and sorting out some of those key issues um, when they occur. So I think one of the, the bits of feedback that we picked up really um, as we went forward in the consultation was the a lot of shops, businesses, restaurants were closing, um, not making money, uh, not being able to be sustainable because of the lack of people um, on the islands. People were coming in, tending not to go out, tending not to spend money, and there was a real appetite. And I think it was probably about a 80-20 split there were some people that were saying, well, we definitely don't want any more day trippers. We've got enough people coming on. We want to just keep the place um, closed down. Um, the other side of the coin was a lot of businesses were really, really keen um, to get that increased volume of day trip market. With the fast ferry, that opens that up. Um, but clearly, with bringing day trip in with no accommodation, there's quite a lot of planning going on behind the scenes to say, <clears throat> how, how do we actually manage that so we don't have people... Um, out here on the islands if the weather's deteriorating and things like that. So we're really working in advance weather um, monitoring system to make sure that anybody that we, we bring out on a day trip that we can guarantee we can get them back again. Then we've got contingency. If we do have a an area where we end up with people stuck on the island, the same as when I was at sea running cruise ships, we all had, always had a contingency if we had passengers ashore, what we would do with them. Um, and how we would accommodate them. So that's an area that we've been looking at quite closely to make sure that there's a contingency plan. And I think tying that into the, the council's emergency contingent, contingency plan is something that we'll probably be, <clears throat> probably be doing over the next um, few weeks. So I think dogs is one of the things that came up in every single consultation about 50 times. Um, and if we're having two golden retrievers, um, myself, I think we, we, we've been at pains to try and come up with a system on board the fast ferry um, to really accommodate dogs. And I think one of the things we learned was there is no consensus when it comes to dogs. Some people wanted a dog's area, some people wanted them on their lap, some people wanted them all in a dog zone. So I think look, we've taken a fairly simple view on it at the moment. Let, let's get the dogs on the ferry and see how it pans out, you know. Um, I think we even had one request if we could plant some grass someplace on the ferry. But, um, so Atlantic Wolf, and I think look, I, I had a, a name in my mind that was Silly Express. Beth convinced me to uh, go out to the local primary school and let the kids um, name the ferry. And what a brilliant name they came up with. I think it, it's certainly something that uh, us old, old people didn't uh, have that much much creative uh, imagination to get there, but I think Atlantic Wolf is uh, such a fitting name um, for the vessel. So I think she's a 2018 um, fast cat catamaran. Um, she's got 3,000 hours on her, so virtually brand new. She was laid up during the whole um, COVID pandemic. The engines that's on her, she's got caterpillars uh, driving for um, Kamawa water jets, um, speed around uh, up to 30 knots. And again, with the engines that we've got, reduced the emissions, um, reduced fuel consumptions. Because um, really, when you look at getting into the model now, it's about how you become um, as competitive as you possibly can. So she's 42 metres, um, draft one and a half. Um, you know, she's sitting in the water at 1.2 at the moment. And as I mentioned, um, up to 4.1 significant wave height. So I think she takes four, 400 passengers, five crew, um, full air conditioning, 
uh, three cabins on board, um, first class, premium, um, and standard class. As we see here, um, here here's some more pictures um, and our current livery. Um, she's got a, a large tunnel um, at the front, which uh, we believe will be from the modeling that we've done or work well um, in, the, in the sea conditions we've got. Being a newer vessel, uh, we don't envisage um, any refit, repair, upgrade um, to get her into service. She just had a new um, certification from BV issued recently. Um, all we need to do is do up to the paint job um, and get her moving. So as you can see, all aircraft style seating, um, USB ports, um, powered banks um, by, by the seats, and there'll be a full Starlink internet service um, on board. So freight, freight operations, um, when we're looking at it, as we mentioned, the, the three existing vessels for freight, the vessel on the left-hand side of the screen um, is the Terramar, um, the Valonia in the middle that you've probably seen quite a bit of out here recently. Um, she's been working on the project uh, mapping the seabed, and you'll notice her uh, orange around the, red, the top of the wheelhouse is slowly turning into uh, a Harland and Wolf um, rape yellow um, as we go on. And I, I certainly think you won't miss uh, Julian's boats coming in now when they, uh, they, they come through the fog. Um, so I think that the vessels that, that we've picked so far um, are really bespoke for getting in. Um, the refit that Julian was talking about on the Samson, we've just installed in the process, installing a bow thruster um, tunnel in there as well, so that with it being a bigger vessel, when we're coming into some more of the tight, tight corners, um, we've got that ability um, to go into some places. Bear with me. Um, so when you look at the, the marine services um, offering, um, it's really all around the UK from our, our offices that we've got. Um, we've got barges that operate around the UK um, for transferring parts between our yards, uh, for transferring parts for major projects. And we've got a tug that we're in the process of bringing into this route. So it'll really be that whole round the UK um, piece. And Silly is just one piece of that. So I think there's a lot bigger resilience in the number of vessels that we'll have operating. Um, and I think, you know, daily sailings available. I think when you look at the projects up to 150 tonnes in delivering freight um, into St Mary's, but then obviously straight into the beaches. And I think one of the key things that we've been looking at um, is how we operate on both the freight vessels and the high speed passenger vessel, really to incorporate as many local enterprises as we can. Um, for the freight, clearly we're working with uh, the, the two freight companies on either side, um, which is working really well. The, the amount of breakages and deliveries we've got, you can count on one hand. And I think there's a, a rule between the, the group that any issues we've got, we get dealt with within seven days. Um, you know, one of the things that came out in the consultation is, you know, we don't want to see damages claims that are, get ignored and lie about for six months. So, you know, we're keen to get that done fairly quickly. And I think when we look at the operations on board the vest on board the fast ferry, um, again, we're bringing in um, IMS to operate the vessel on our behalf. Um, certainly for the first season, these guys are experts in operating high-speed ferries globally. Um, they'll come in and do the, 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 the um, bath and trials in Dale is arranging to do the pilot exemption certificate with them when they're in. Um, after the first season, we may bring that in-house. We may leave it um, outsourced. Um, let's see where that goes um, as it pans in. But again, the catering on board and things like that, we're looking to source locally, um, use products and produce um, to supply on the vessel um, at all the times. So I think just to summarise, um, and I'll see if Julian um, has got anything after me that he just wants to touch on quickly. Um, look, value for money is one of the things that has driven us at every element of this programme. Because I think when you look at where things are now with the 
leveling up fund being w withdrawn um, in the two new vessels that um, are meant to be coming in, um, we see there being a, a huge, and we're already seeing it, a huge increase in the tariffs. We don't believe those tariffs are sustainable. We're doing everything we can with the operation to get tariffs down so it's value for money. But I think there's value for money, but there's also really looking at that quality of service for passengers and, you know, actually really up in the standards and up in, up in the quality. And I think having four girls o over the years, it always amazed me when you try to do something with kids, how much it actually costs. So I think some of the people we met whilst we were here were really lit, telling us they're stranded on the islands because they can't afford um, the prices to get off. And that's something in this day and age that's just not acceptable for, for, for me personally or, or our business. Um, so I think we're, we're trying to do something um, around that. When you look at the long-term vision that we've got, it's about a long-term. This is not something we're coming into to try to see if it works. And then if it doesn't work, we're going to go away again. Um, we, we've entered this market for the long term. I think by having marine services that's based not just around the Isles of Scilly, because we know things will get challenging here from time to time with it up in the downscale of the projects. Um, the fact that we actually go and do projects elsewhere and manage the fleet really gives us that resilience. And I think we, we've invested significantly already. Um, you're starting to see that investment come through with the start of the new vessels. And I think that's not the end of it. We're looking at the next step and the next step and the next stage to see where we can get there. And I think it also involves some of the younger people and how can we, one of the focus groups we've got running at the moment is to say, how can we use some of the, the younger islanders um, within the wider Harland and Wolf group? And is there a transition and a pathway to do more um, to provide some long-term sustainable jobs as we, as we move forward? And I think that's also working in, as I said, conjunction with the, the local businesses. So I think that the supply chain for us is key. It's, it's critical. And I think everything remains here. And one of the things we're trying not to do is uh, take other business, business away from businesses. We're trying to work with businesses to, to create the, the right opportunities so that we can all thrive together um, as we go forward. And I think community being at the heart of everything we do, um, you know, we've been in consultation with the, the local radio station um, to see how we can sponsor some of the programmes that they, they're working on. Um, as well as we bring the, the new ferry into service. So there'll be some announcements um, on that as we go forward. But I think, you know, that this whole year round service is something that we're, we're fairly passionate about. And I think, you know, it's putting Salonians first. And I think a lot of people worry about a competition. They worry about the, the, the what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. Look, I think there's a lot of really intelligent people here um, and on the mainland, and I think ultimately competition's a good thing. People will vote with their feet and make decisions based on what's right for them, the pricing that they're getting, the quality of service they're getting. Um, we're not frightened of competition. We weren't frightened when the levelling up fund was available to compete if we were successful in that, to complete a route every few years. Um, because at the end of the day, if you're operating a good service, you're providing value for money, you don't care about a competition. So that, that concludes um, what I've got to say. Julian, have you got anything you want to add at this stage? Or? Uh, no, no, just to take any questions about freight, because I'm sure there is plenty of them. So. Perfect. <laughs> cool. Well, that concludes, uh, Beth, is there anything? That concludes our presentation. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll throw it open to members. Councillor Mumford. Um, I do see um, your boats are environmentally friendly. Can they be made in the future more than that? Or have you got as far as you can? Is that just at the moment? Or no, I think when you look at vessels at the moment, one of the things by having our own vessels, we've actually just incorporated Harland & Wolf Technologies um, up in Aberdeen. And that's really looking at electric propulsion. It's looking at hydrogen propulsion. 
and it's looking at how you can do things differently and reduce carbon. So I think one of the things we're looking to do in the future is say, how can we use the existing vessels in the fleet as test platforms for new technology? Because the problem that you've got at the moment is there's about 18 different types of technology. Um, so it's actually looking to say, right, what is the best technology that you can get and how what is the best to use? So I think we intend to use uh, the vessels that we've got in the fl fleet to test the technology. So I think we're sort of at that pioneering end of that and investing in it. But look, there's a lot of grants available for that as well. So I guess it's really chasing some of those grants to upgrade the vessels as we go to be pioneer and then start exporting some of that technology. And um, how do your passengers get off your ship? Do you have to have a gangway to go on? And also, in the same question, um, what about disabled people, wheelchairs, et cetera? How does, is it all all right for that as well? So what we've got at the moment, the vessel's got three access points. I'll just go back on the slides. So if you actually look on this slide, um, on the lower deck, on the aft end, you've got a gangway. Um, at the end, it's actually got on this starboard side, it's actually a gangway that just lowers off the ship down onto the quay side. It's got a second gangway um, on, on the middle deck. And one of the things as part of the bathing trials we are looking at is a gangway that comes onto the upper deck um, to make sure that we get wheel, wheelchair access onto the vessel at all times. And I think when you look at the schedule, and the booking system that we've got, again, that's taken into height, taken into difference, the key side height. And again, part of the test and trials is to actually, we've got the G's and the drawings, but we just want to make sure we've got that right. In Penzance, um, we need to put in a couple of extra bits um, and a, a key side and a ramp to give us that access on one of the buffs we're using there. Um, but again, disabled access is something that shouldn't be available to some and not available to others. It's something that should be available to everyone. So it's something that we're working hard to make sure it's available. Will it be available at all states of the tide? No, but we have, we've got solutions and we've got plans in place to make sure that we've got access um, available at all times. And and, and and it's sort of wheeled on luggage, isn't there? Is a specific mm. size or weight? And is a do they take their luggage with them or is, is it wrapped so they can pick it up, so the, it there, the, pick it up off? It's really like if, if you align it to a train service, when you get on a train, it's yeah. like what, what you can take to go on the train, on the vessel. Um, if you can see the mouse, can you see the mouse on that screen? No, you can't. Um, can you? Okay, so if you look on the vessel here and here, there's luggage racks oh, here. You look all around the front area here, there's luggage racks here, there's luggage racks aft across here. Then again, on this deck, um, there's luggage racks aft, luggage racks midships, and then luggage racks forward. So there's quite a lot of luggage. We were actually surprised um, at the amount of luggage space that is on the vessel. But I think one of the things we're keen not to do is somebody to bring 30 bits of luggage with them and they're creating a safety hazard going getting onto the vessel. So, and I think it's something that we're taking a fairly open view on that let's try it and we're restricting it a little bit to begin with by saying one bag that you can carry yourself. Let's see what that looks like as we get further down the line. And it may be easier to, what, what I don't want to do is set a higher limit and then say you can take less now. I'd rather set a lower limit then relax it as we go forward once we see how it all pans out, you know. Because I think we need to be flexible. There'll be things that we've not thought of There'll be things we need to change, and I think there'll be things as time goes on that we need to modify. So I think it's just keeping that flexible approach. And um, going to the freight, have you got freezer facilities on? So I think freight? I'll probably start say? off on this one, then I'll, I'll throw it across to my, 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 my learned colleague here. Um, look, the idea in the, the longer term with this, when we have these two dedicated freight boats that we're going to have going each day, we want to have eight foot containers that are racked for ambient, cold and frozen so that and we want that the long the mid term vision is to actually have a, a site off site that people actually can get stuff delivered to not deliver on a key at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon with one leg in the air. If the sun's out, we want it to be that any time of the day you can get stuff delivered. It goes into storage, it goes into the containers that are all racked up straight out of the van into the containers. The containers are kept at the right temperature, they get unplugged, taken down to the ship, 
put on the ship, plugged in back to the ship, and then they're unplugged at this end when they get here um, and lifted on. So I think it's certainly something that we see as a, a major flaw. Um, and I think you, know, you only have to see the, the queues outside the COPE um, when, the, when there's no food and everybody queuing up. You know, surely in this day and age, we can do a bit better than that, you know? Okay. Did, um, sorry, Julian, did you have anything to add to that? No, you covered that. Okay, sorry. Right. Okay. Um, just one last question. Uh, what, oh no, actually one before that, um, if in the future you ever came to build um, boats, because I, I believe you could do freight and passengers together, is there not um, a health and safety problem? Because that's we're always told that there's a health and safety problem if you've got so many passengers and freight. I just wondered... Well, I think if I haven't you looked up the laws myself, yeah, so. if you look at a set of rules called SOLAS, um, Safety of Life at Sea, that actually came into play on the back end of the Titanic sinking, that's been around for decades. And you look at some of the big Ropax ferry that runs across, and I think where our most recent experience on that is running across the Northern Ireland back and forward, where there's 150 tonnes of freight going back and forward, 400 passengers and a whole load of cars full of petrol. So I think there's a full set of regulations. Look, there's certain individual items like aviation fuel and things like that that you carve out and you do something separate with them. But for general, row packs is the way to go. If you look around the, the, the globe these days, probably 80% of the ferries and the conventional ferries are all row packs. And that's really giving you the, the, you're carrying the passengers at the same time as you're carrying the freight. And I think, you know, having a massive vessel that's going to be paid for, you're going to have to pay a loan back on every day of the week when it's laid up in the winter because you've got no passengers, makes no sense. The, the economics just don't add up. Whereas when you've got a row parks, you can operate that row parks over the winter. <coughs> and if you had two vessels, our idea would have been, you would have had one vessel operating over the winter, two vessels operating in the summer. So you would have still had that passenger capacity and that, that was sort of our solution to it. Then when you increase the key side, you build a new key side, you put some new infrastructure in, then you'd have a ramp on the back of the, the fast ferry. You could load it um, in Penzance with a ramp, ramp in the corner of the dock straight off the key side. So your loading time comes down. And then in the future, when you look at future investment in uh, port infrastructure, um, that's where you then build port infrastructure that could take uh, rural and look, you would have no intention of bringing cars um, across, but you would actually get your freight across unloaded a lot quicker, more efficiently. Because I think when you look at the current operation at the moment and the number of people that involves, it's just completely inefficient. Whereas when you look at the operation that even will be running with the, the smaller um, freight vessels, the majority of the stuff will all be containerized off site, off the key. So it comes down the key, eight foot containers loaded on, um, the occasional 20 foot when we need it loaded on, off we go, same at this side, and off we go. Clearly, the 20 foot containers present a problem at this side, so they have to be unloaded on the key, but the eight foot containers can move straight up and be distributed from off the key. Because I think when you look at the one of the high risk areas for us in all of this is when you look at the key congestion over the coming months and years. Okay, thank you. I think Steve was next. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, it, it, going back to Avril's first point about the <clears throat> environmental impact of the service, you've partially, you've actually answered it pretty well. Uh, high-speed craft presumably is high-speed fuel consumption as well, and the uh, the Environment Act has recognised marine pollution as one of the worst examples of of, uh, of pollution. Um, and they mention sulfur and nitrogen uh, um, components and also what's called black carbon, actually, uh, and affects not just the atmosphere, but also the sea as well. So uh, I think you partially answered the question about looking at uh, alternative propulsion systems, such as electricity or hydrogen. Mm. You mentioned probably, well, you didn't mention them, but you mentioned there are many others as well, mm. uh, which is quite true. Um, so I'll move on to the second point I was going to make. I spoke to the our harbour master recently. He's quite, I wouldn't say he was comfortable, but he's quite happy with the scheduling at this end of the operation. 
I mean, the boatmen might complain from time to time as they, they, they're bound to. You've got one sitting over there. So that's part of the, uh, the reason for being a boatman. But um, the, the, <laughs> the, the, second, the, the second part of that is um, it's, uh, the scheduling may be OK this end, but he believed there could have been could be issues in Penzance. And have they been resolved? Look, I think when you look at the, I'll touch on your first point, Foss, briefly, just on the environmental. I think the reason we've gone for the vessel, we've gone issues only 2018 and only had 3,000 hours. So when you look at the emissions off of those vessels, and when you talk about the maritime industry getting the, the, the heavy um, burden of the amount of carbon that they emit, that's really on your slow speed engines. Um, not so much in medium speed engines and a lot of the heavy fuel oil that's burned and not your gasoline oil um, and your marine diesel oil. But what where the marine diesel oil is even going to is uh, biofuels. So I think you even see your biofuels kicking in um, as you go forward. So I think that's all things we're looking at. But then there comes a, a balance in this to say that the biofuels more expensive. So where do we want the, ch the more expensive uh, ticket prices versus biofuel and environmentally friendly, or do we want the cheaper ticket prices? So I think, look, our view is we just try and strike a happy medium when the technology comes to a price where it's palatable for everybody, that then you, you bring it into play. Um, when you look at the schedule, what we identified yesterday, and we spent um, three hours walking around with Harbour Master James in Penzance, is there's actually four bus that we can use in Penzance with this vessel. We can go inside the dock, um, and we've got a permanent bus agreed um, in the top left-hand corner of the dock looking from the gate up. So that will be the vessel's permanent bus there. We've got the back of the rank building where we're going to put in some spud leg barges along the back of that so it takes us out into the deeper water then we've got the albert key the steps and the stairs on the end to that um, then we've got the end of the lighthouse pier should we need it so the 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 process that was put in place to block us out at every angle is unfortunately what is not sorry unfortunately not what and i think that's why we've sort of held back on the details of the actual vessel until the last minute so the amount of time somebody can have to block us um, is pretty much gone away and expired. So I think we've we, we've been playing uh, as you do in a competitive environment. We've been playing the game a little bit um, as we've continued to tie everything down. You know. Yeah, th thanks for that. But of course, both ends are open ports, so uh, they, they, they are. But I think when you get people booking, trying to book five years in advance, <laughs> when you try and get people booking five years in advance and re refusing to move off the bus and go to anchor because they've booked in advance, they're not quite so open. Um, so I did have to 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 write to the uh, CEO of one of the councils, uh, just remind them of what the open port policy is um, and what the obligations on users are. Um, and again, yeah, we, we're flexible. And I think, you know, when you look at the boatman and that, one of the things we did when we were out here is we met with the boatman. I even spent some time with uh, John and went across and looked at the route and looked at how they operate and everything like that so I could get a handle on it. And I think, you know, from a, an early age, I, I grew up with my father as a fisherman. We've got fishing trawlers. I've got my own pleasure boat. Um, I understand ports, understand harbours. And I think that the idea is, you know, there's give and take everywhere. Um, and it's about everybody working together for the greater good, you know. Um, yeah, just one thing you didn't mention, the plus, you must have really revitalised the yellow paint industry in this. <laughs> um, but one question that I think that probably we, I sort of, can sort of know the answer, but I think a lot, a lot of the public won't know is why? Why did you get invested in, so invested in this route? Because you are heavily invested. It's gone back a little, a little way, I think. So look, I think when you look at the, the whole strategy that we put in place um, back in 2018 into 2019, it was all about ferries. It was all about marine operations. Um, we've been sitting back, waiting for an opportunity waiting for a project that we saw that we could add a lot of value to very quickly. Um, we're looking at Channel Islands also um, at the same time. We're looking at another project up in Scotland to say, hey, where can we add value to? When you look at 
when you look at silly, the bar is so low at the moment, it's not hard to add value and actually start to create value. And look, we're in business, we're here to make money. Um, we're not here to profiteer, we're here to make money. Um, but we see with, with the service and the offering we've got on, we can actually make some fundamental differences um, to the foldability of the services. Because quite frankly, if we weren't here um, and the levelling up fund wasn't used um, and the aircrafts weren't flying and the helicopters wouldn't be flying, you, you'd end up in a, a bit landlocked because the, the vessels will price themselves out of, this, out of the market because they're just not suitable. A, they're not suitable vessels. B, they're unaffordable vessels. And C, they're going to be unable to sail half empty all the time, is which is the reality of what you're going into. Yeah, cool. OK. Um, so I think Steve alluded to grumpy boatman. <laughs> Which hopefully I'm not one, um, but there was quite a grumpy meeting that I need to make you aware. It's probably not quite the right agenda here, but I just want to raise it. Um, there was a little bit of concern locally on Ireland. Obviously, for commercial reasons, you're not um, giving your details out, but can I encourage you fairly soon to let let, offer it, let other boating operators know of, for example, check-in times? Yeah. Because we need, because obviously we we're having people booking and your vessel, mm. and then we don't know what time they need to be at the key side to depart. Well, one of the things we, we are going to do, as soon as the vessel leaves Barcelona, where she is at the moment, um, we're actually going to come across and spend a week here and actually sit down with all the individual groups and do another, the briefings that we did the last time, we're going to roll out right. um, so that everybody's aware um, before the vessel arrives exactly what's happening, what we're looking for. And again, one of the key things we're doing with this slow start that we spoke about is what we don't want to do is bring on the first day we turn up, we don't want to turn up with 400 people and it becomes chaos that just achieves nothing for anybody. So I think we, we've certainly restricted the booking system to keep the numbers lower um, to begin with so that when we come in, we see how it works, see what we need to tweak, see what we need to change. Yeah. And my other slightly nervous head on, mm. um, if we have a deterioration in the weather, and obviously you're, we spoke in the past, mm. I think even in this forum we spoke in the past about the sort of, if you get beyond the 4.1 meters that your vessel's able to operate, yeah. which is reasonably unlikely in the summer, mm. I accept. What alternative sources for those people do you have in place? So I think this that was the that we, we will see a slight customer service issue for um, already makers and residents expecting to go on the 8 o'clock ferry to find that, say, the 8 o'clock ferry is now 9 o'clock, that have a detrimental effect. Yeah. Well, I think, to be fair, as you know, John, the, the, the tide in time in the sea state, wait for nobody. Um, and I think it's no different than what you've got at the moment uh, with helicopters and boats that you're meant to turn up and they, they don't turn up. One of the things that we've really been key to do, and there's quite a lot of modelling going on with this, and we're trying to get it built into an actual bit of software that actually predict, takes it off the, the, the long-term forecasts and the, the swell height predictors to actually see if we're getting that two days before, that is, we're actually not taking somebody out the next day. If we know by the end of that day, it's actually going to be up getting to the marginal limit. So I think it's about taking the decisions quicker rather than waiting until you get to conditions that you're looking at and you're sitting, this is a scruffy day, right? How are we going to get, we need to get across and get everybody off the islands and get back. We should, it's about the prevention, even getting in that mess to begin with. The second bit is if you get stuck with people here, I think we're looking at the emergency contingency plans to say, right, what do we do with people? But I think the view is we, we really don't want to get in that position. We don't want to get stuck, especially with day trips that we're bringing out. So I think we need that 24 hours in advance um, if we see it deteriorate and we don't bring people out. You know, and I, But I think with the three trips a day that we're also talking about, um, up to two trips, maybe up to three trips a day, smaller numbers in and out will make things a bit easier as well, you know. And the final thing that people have asked me personally mm. and the comments I've heard is that the ferry's not going to turn up because I haven't paid any cash. 
at the moment your reservations that, that's are. absolute garbage i know <laughs> just making the call, yeah. just making the statement that's what yeah. i've been told that no one has taken my credit card number the ferry will not be yeah but ultimately though one of the, the views we took from our publicity point of view to begin with is a we don't need the cash off of the bookings to guarantee a seat b why would we ask anybody to book a seat on a ferry they've not seen uh, as in to pay for a ferry they've not seen so we took the view of um the reason for doing the buffing trials on the way back from here before we go and get the p put through the pc is so that everybody will see the ferry at that point then we'll open up the credit card payments because what we don't want to do we, we don't want to sit on everybody's cash cash is tight enough let people sit leave them the choice into the last minute at least they're reserving the seats on it um and i think there's a whilst we've not done an advertising campaign to promote ourselves for the reasons i've spoken about i certainly think there's a, a large advertising campaign um going on in the other direction but look we, we uh, operate how we operate People will see the vessel when it arrives. People will experience the, the trip when they take it. And look, people will vote with their feet, you know. Some people will like it, some people won't. But it's great to have the choice, you know. Oh, yeah, completely agree. So, uh, yeah, that was, I just wanted to pass yeah, it on. No, it's good. not necessarily my yeah, yeah. view, but it's what's been said. No, for sure. Thank you. Um, John, you mentioned about um, trials. What date have you got for Is that the boat coming in here? That, that's the boat coming in here, and that's under discussion with Dale at the moment because we want to do the pilot exemption certificates at the same time. Okay. So that will probably be a couple of dates that we do. And then what, what the intention is, once she's been up to Southampton, had the PC done and come back, we'll enter into service, then we'll probably do, um, we'll probably do some kind of reception um, after that. Um, but depending on where we get to in the meantime, if everything's done and she's back up um, and ready to go, we may do some PR events and that sort of thing before she goes into service on the 1st of May. OK, so we're talking end of April time. Yeah. We'll see her here just to... I, I think you'll see her here before the end of April. I think you'll see her here um, middle of April. OK, thank you. Steve? Yeah, I've got a few, few questions. Um, is it, how's it been, the past special, how's it... Catches running out. How's it being financed? Is it just a cash payment, or is it? I just wonder if there's any debt overhang with the new. Business? I think we we've got a group debt facility. Um, obviously, group debt facility revolving working capital. Um, so that just comes in the overall um, vessel. We we're buying the vessel um, outright from the previous owners. Okay. And the other thing was, um, a schedule. I mean, I, I've looked at it. You know, you know, it's great. You can get off the islands early, but. If the schedule at the moment finishes in early October, mm -hmm. which is a bit of an issue here because of the October half term, that's when virtually the, every local on the island takes advantage of the season finishing, they go on holiday. And uh, if, if it was possible to extend it so it covers the October half term, I think that would be really useful. Uh, and the other one, um, the I was going to say, yeah, um, the, the vessel isn't, none of these vessels at the moment are row row. And now the reason I'm asking this is because if we have some type of row row capable vessel working here, it really makes it a lot, lot easier to get money from government to actually um, get money for key infrastructure because it's really important. Otherwise, we're going to be running the same system they abandoned in Southampton in 1966 for another 40 years. So that, that's a... And that's the big crying shame of where you are at the moment, isn't it? And, uh, and the final one was uh, just to expand a little bit on the potential 24 seat freighter because I mean that was quite intriguing because it's certainly at the moment we've got the last six weeks have been absolutely chaotic trying to get on and off the island. Thank you. I'll just try to keep it short, answer short, yeah. please, John. Okay. Um, touching through them the half term, we don't see that as an issue. That's something we'll look at. That's weather dependent. I think, you know, by the time you get into that back end of the year, you know, the predicted swell states are a bit higher. So I think that's just the suck it and see and see how you get on. When, when you look at the all year round freight vessel, sorry, um, freight vessel and, and passenger vessel, um, like the CTVs operate all year round, sea states up to six and a half, seven metres. Um, so that vessel is really to get people on and off. Um, that's in refit at the moment. That's an aluminium um, catamaran. Um, and again, that will come across probably towards the end of the summer. We're putting new, looking for new engines and everything in that. So it's 
Parker, state of the art, um, good to go. When you look at the row parks, I think look, we're, it's just a ridiculous position that we're in. The the, the government had funding, um, the funding was there not to be used. It's been turned down because people didn't want the competition. Um, and the only people that's going to suffer is the islanders. And I think some people need to have that on their conscience uh, for a good few years to come. You know, I think it's it's something that's a tragedy that you've not been able to modernise um, as you've moved forward. And I think the, the cost and the repayment of that vessel is something that I don't believe the numbers add up. I don't believe the limited rates of the, the, the charges and the percentage increases don't add up. Um, so I think whilst we've not highlighted any of that, um, you know, we'll, we'll let the market decide for itself, you know, as time goes on. But it won't be pretty, you know. Thank you, Trump. Tim. Uh, yeah, sorry, we're running out of time. Um, I did have some other questions, but I, I guess the one question I get asked more than more than anything else is, is what Steve asked you, which is why. Um, and one of the things that you're accused of, if you like, is that it's... Um, it's just a, a way to get back at the steamship company for the way they treated you during the levelling up fund business. Now, I'm not expecting you to say, yeah, that's exactly what it is. We just hate them and we're going to put them out of business. But can I get some reassurance? You, you know, you've talked about it already about your long term goals, but there's a lot of cynicism about everything to do with sea links down here at the moment, as you can imagine. Mm. So in your best way can you reassure us that you're here for the long time? Look, I think one of the things we did was we spent a lot of time um, working with, with Steamship. We, we put a lot of time into designs um, and trying to convince them that the way they wanted to go was probably not the way to go. Um, we redesigned and offered up some vessels that we thought could work. Um, they decided not to. I think it's like all, all business, you know. You win some, you lose some. You know, I lose contracts every day of the week from some places. I win contracts. So I think winning or losing a contract and to be fair we've not actually been told yet officially we've not won um we just read in the news um that they are awarded to the vietnamese shipyard um it, the same as everybody else did so i think yeah was that a bit rude yes did it bother me no, not really i think we'd already started probably six weeks eight weeks ten weeks before that working on alternative plans because we thought there was so much better use of that leveling up funding um, and I think, look, with, with all we operate in a competitive environment in the, in the shipyard and fabrication space, we operate, um, again, in the marine services space against multiple operators. And that's how businesses operate. They, they, they work together, as we demonstrated at Christmas. We were kind of the, the bigger people that came um, uh, out and said, right, let's get this freight moving. And we, we could have just sat back at that point and said, well, eh, everything that's gone on, we'll sit back and watch. Um, no, we didn't. We stepped up to the plate. Julian put down his Christmas turkey sandwich that he was beginning to get ready and and, and got the boat moving. So, look, I think all operators, we, we operate around the UK and globally with people. Um, and, look, I don't see that being any different from the steamship once they get over it. Well, clearly, they've still got a bit of getting over the pain of having a, some competition. Um, once they get over that, then I'm sure it'll be a, a peaceful and harmonic relationship, you know. Brilliant, thank you. And with that, I think we can end the questions there. I'd like to thank you uh, for attending this session. Um, what we'll do now is we are going to vote uh, as members to take it back into part one. So you guys, again, thank you very much. You're free to stick around or go if you want to go well, and enjoy some sunshine. Lovely. Thank you very much, and look, I appreciate um, being given time to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you. So members, back to uh, the recommendations. Um, recommendation two is following the completion of the presentations and questions refer to recommendation one. Members approve the meeting moves back into part one. Can I have a oh, sir, yes, please? Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Mumford. All those in favour? Thank you. We are now back in part one. Um, we've got two recommendations here. Um, that's Members note the proposals set out in the presentations from two ceiling operators um, and the responses from the questions that uh, you guys so skillfully asked and that members recommend the info information gathered by this committee be formally submitted to full council and used to inform any further consideration of transport related matters at this 
and other council meetings in the future. Proposed by Councillor Dean, seconded by Councillor Peacock. All those in favour, thank you. That's unanimous. With that, the meeting is over.